We're in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. We're coming to a close of this section of Paul's letter uh, to the Ephesians. Instead of a 47-page manuscript today, I opted for 10. I hope that's pleasing to you. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, we ask your blessing on the preaching of the word. And specifically, God, I pray, Lord, uh, I give you thanks for the time spent with you and your word in submission to you to wonder, to learn as a pastor how humbling your word is. God, that I might preach it faithfully to your people for the sake of your people and for your glory. Be with us now and for our church family online. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as we enter this week's message, it is found in Ephesians 3, 14 through 21. Paul turns to a prayer. It's 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 not the first time he's prayed in this in, in Ephesians, okay? But he turns to a prayer for the church. It's a special kind of prayer. This is a sanctifying prayer. And though the word sanctify, you're not going to find it in the text today, I assure you the idea that Paul is praying for here is the idea of sanctification of the church. And if this is a prayer of sanctification, we may as well understand what is sanctification. What exactly is it, okay? Well, sanctification is this process that begins at our conversion. And it continues through the remainder of our lifetime where God conforms us. God conforms us to the image of Christ. Now, the Koine Greek word for sanctify is hagiazo. Hagiazo. You can probably see it here up on my screen. I forgot that screen this week. Hagiazo. All right? It's the same root structure as the word for holy or saint. That word is hagios. So hagiazo, hagios. These three words, holy, saint, and sanctify, are related. The word hagios is the same word I've been preaching on for several weeks now. I said holy one week, and then I said saint the next week and they're very well connected now the word holy means to be set apart unto God set apart it could be an object it could be a person it could be ground itself we'll see that today this happens at the moment of our salvation you are holy God says of all the people you're mine you're my man my woman set apart unto me now Haggai used in another form refers to saint these are the ones who are set apart the elect of God if you're in Christ Congratulations, you're a saint. After we are saved, then we are in this time of sanctified or sanctification, hagiazo. All right? So that's, that's when it begins. And it's an ongoing and continuous work of God to conform us to his son's image. It's how we live out our faith. It's how we live out this idea of holiness in our life. Even though, and here's an important thing, even though, and obviously, we still are dealing with the effects of sin in, in the world. Yet God says, Hagiaso, Hagiaso, sanctified. Let me explain to you something. There's a, a, Dr. Bruce Wilkinson taught a series called Personal Holiness in Times of Temptation. Some will push back and think there's nothing, no such thing as a personal holiness, okay? And he talked about, though, in his, in his teaching on personal holiness in times of temptation, he said there are three stages to holiness, and they all work together as this not only a redemptive work of God, but a sanctifying work of God over our whole lives. So let me explain to you. Dr. Uh, Wilkinson used Exodus 3, verse 5. He gave us an example. This is the scene where Moses is on top of Mount Horeb. There's the burning bush scene, and, uh, and he comes, and, uh, and God says, take off your sandals. Now watch this. He, he, God tells Moses something he had never heard. He said, do not come near take off your sandals off or take the sandals off your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground Moses didn't know the ground was holy he had no idea the ground was holy to him it appeared that this ground was the same as all the rest of the ground that was around him but you see in God's mind God set that ground apart because of his presence there from all the other ground and God said this ground is holy because God's presence made it holy so god told moses that the ground was holy this is the first stage of holiness it's in god's mind being set apart in god's mind what god says about us moses then understood once god told him so moses then understands 
he comes to an understanding in Moses' mind. He believes what God says, and he's like, wow, the ground is holy. That's the second stage of holiness. So God said it, now it's in our mind. We believe it. Moses believed God. The third stage is what Dr. Wilkinson calls our presentation. This is where we present ourselves and we act upon the idea that God said it, we believe it, and now we want to live it. In this case, Moses would have taken his sandals off because the ground he was standing was holy and he knew it. He didn't know it before. Now he knew it. When we're saved, God says about you that you are holy unto him, you personally. Drawn out from all the people, this is true in his mind, because he has set us apart from all of the people unto Christ. That's the first stage. This is our spiritual position before God. And it's a one-time event. We cannot add to the idea that, that somehow we become more holy than at this moment than when we are saved. But we can live holy, but in, in God's view of our justification before him, we're never any more holy than when we are saved in Christ. But there is a living out of holiness, and this is our sanctification, and I think we should do that. We don't always know the fullness about what God is saying, though, until after we're saved. You know, not everybody, when they get saved, goes, oh, God said I'm holy, and now I believe I'm holy. That seems to come a little bit later for some people. What they know is that I've trusted in Jesus Christ, and because I've trusted in Christ, I know I'm saved, but the idea of holiness seems to come as they are aware of the word of the Lord taught to them, what God has done. They discover this, and it, it just starts to blow. They're like, well, what do you mean I'm holy? I don't feel holy. I know Jesus saved me, but I still have all this sin. But we can assure them, if they've trusted in Christ for their salvation, they are, in fact, before God, justified, positionally, holy. And when they come to believe it, and it touches their mind, this is that second stage of holiness, it leads people to start doing something strange. They start submitting to God, because when they see His holiness, and all of a sudden they believe it's in them, then they submit, and they begin to present their bodies to God. They humble themselves before God. And we see this, this third stage of holiness, this presentation. And in Romans 12, 1 and 2, we'll look at that scripture in just a few, in a few paragraphs. But uh, um, I'm going to say this up front. This is our presentation, the presenting of our bodies. And, and the result of the presentation of ourselves is this thing called metamorphose or metamorphosis in our modern English. There's a changing of the mind that comes when we submit to God. When he says that we believe it and we submit ourselves to God. Something changes dramatically in us. God begins to conform us to the image of his sons. That's the three stages of holiness. We begin to change. We grow. We put away things that are offensive to God. Not perfectly, but we find ourselves growing in Christ. And we desire more and more. Our desire is to please the Lord. This is sanctification. Hagiazo. Hagiazo. That's what this is. Over your lifetime. God declared it. You are holy. This is your salvation. It's in his mind. We believe it. I am made holy. It's in our mind. We live it out. God, teach me to live holy. I surrender to you. This is in our daily living. Now let's get to our verses today in Ephesians 3. We're going to start in verse 14. Now, when we get to 16 through 19, that's the prayer. But in verse 14 and 15, it sets up the prayer. Okay? Paul writes, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father. Verse 14 of Ephesians 3. Paul here is humbling himself before God in his writing. Paul in his writing to the church in Ephesus, he's both not only leading the church to bow their knees before God, but he's both praying for them and he's leading them by example. He's teaching them. You know, people don't necessarily know to do this. Humble yourselves before God. They need to be taught. Get on your knees and sometimes lay down and weep before God. And Paul is saying, humble yourselves before God Almighty. And surely Paul expects the leaders of this church to take notice of this. This would be their practice. This is what they should do. And the members should come to do this and enjoy this time of prayer with the Lord. Prayer is essential in the life of the church. We ought to pray every day. In our own lives. However, on the Lord's Day, we dedicate a time. We set aside a time, 6.30 Sunday nights, to come together and to pray. That's what we do. For the sake of the church and the ministries that we have here. And it's a powerful thing to have the church pray together. 
to pray to God for vision and for power itself to do what we need to do and for mercy and for the care of the needs of our members. And we've had the need for a lot of care this week. We've had the need. And there's a lot of need as we've been so disconnected. A video screen ain't going to get it done. You know, I mean, it'll help us over time, but it's not the same. God is caring for his people. Here's your first application. Now I want you to notice on your bulletin today, we're going to say six or three, six, four, okay? Three stages of holiness. It's right there at the bottom of your, of the inside back page. Three stages of holiness. So you can refer to that. We're going to see that pattern. And then flip to the back page. There's six specific petitions that Paul offers in his prayer. And then there are four applications. You can write those in yourself. This is the first one. Be faithful and humble in your prayers. Be faithful and humble in your prayers. Be faithful to pray and be humble when you do pray. Right? That's how we should be. Get on your knees and pray to God. God loves his family very much. He does. And because God loves his family, he would do pretty much anything short of violating his own nature. He'll never do that for his family and for their needs. To sustain them, to strengthen them, and for their benefit. Look at verse 15. Paul was praying to God the Father, who has said, From whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. Now, this, this naming has a twofold meaning. Everybody created on earth is created in the image of God. The lost and the elect alike are created in the image of God. But the second and greater meaning points to our new creation in Christ. They are named for this. In Christ, the church here and on, on earth and the church in heaven are all named of God in Christ. Only in this identity in Christ can Paul now come to the prayer that he's going to give us and his six petitions. This is a very bold prayer, one that I hope we will think of often. In verses 16 through 19, God is sanctifying his family. God is strengthening his family in this prayer. Now here's what it says in verses 16 through 19. The prayer. That according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's the prayer. In this prayer, there are six requests. You can see them. I put them there on your bulletin. Verse 16, that they would be strengthened. But strengthened how? In the inner man. By and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 17, that Christ would dwell in their hearts. In the second part of 17, that they would be rooted and grounded in the love of Christ. And in 18, that they would not only comprehend and have understanding of spiritual truths with the rest of the saints. And in 19, that they would come to know that this love of Christ actually surpasses just simply knowing or knowledge. And lastly, in the last part of verse 19, they would be filled with the fullness of God. You see those there. Now, if these requests of Paul are to be realized, then the church must be sanctified. They can't live lawless and ongoing. You will not experience these things in that, in that state. You, otherwise, there's no need to pray for strength in the inner man for the love of Christ. Now, here's Paul's first petition, that you would be strengthened. A special kind of strength in verse 16. According to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. Brother Tom passed on into glory Thursday morning. He died. Wednesday, I think sometime in the afternoon, he and I had a good conversation, a prayer. And I was still like, hey, we got a table set up for you. I think it's on that table there labeled warden at the end. And uh, thinking he's going to get to come. Now, he has a much better view of things right now than we do. But I could sense that things weren't well and they didn't know if he would be able to come. He passed on the next day. I said, Tom, I don't know that you're going to get to hear this part of the sermon. I know you've read it before, but let me, let me just pray it for you anyhow then. Why don't we read it and then we'll pray it. That God would strengthen you in the inner man, your inner being, as your body begins to shut down. 
and things begin to fall away for you, that God would strengthen you in your spirit inside and draw you closer to him as things began to fail all around you. And God honored that prayer. Right? Tom died peacefully. It was sort of terrible and beautiful all at the same time. What a privilege to pray for Tom and to know Tom and to pray in this way like Paul prayed for the church. What a privilege. <laughs> if God... You know what Tom heard a couple weeks ago? Three weeks max. Mr. Warden, maybe three weeks. He went home knowing you're going to hospice, maybe three weeks, maybe. He, I think he made it too. What would you choose to do with your life if you knew that was it? 21 days at the most and it's done. Well, he put his affairs in order. He loved his wife, Gloria, and his friends and family. He did. He talked to them. and he, he called me up one day just to pray for me. So humbling. This man who's dying, he calls me to pray for He said, no, I don't want to hear from... I don't, he kept redirecting me. I said, no, Tom, let me... He said, no, I want to pray for you. And then he decided to write a worship song to God and play it on Saturday. And Miss Gloria sends me videos of this. And this is how he spent his time. And then we prayed. I thought, what a privilege as a pastor to have a man like that in a congregation and to watch him go into glory in such a manner. What an example. People who get similar news without the Lord, they fight and they're bitter, not Tom. I thank Tom for his witness and I'm happy that he's in heaven but his presence is felt, his, that, that he's missed here. This prayer is not for a physical strength. It's instead an abiding inner strength that Paul is praying for, for you, for the church in Ephesus. Paul knows that this type of strength is needed for the church. It's not timid. It's not half-hearted. It's powerful. And it's given through God the Holy Spirit. In the Baptist Confession of Faith, which Ch Charles was reading from earlier, chapter 13 on sanctification, here's Article 1. They thought about these things. Now, now, the Baptist Confession of Faith is not the Word of God. It quotes the Word of God, and it orders it so that we can understand certain doctrines. So it's not our authoritative text. It tells us about the authoritative text. Article 1, those who are united in Christ and effectually called and regenerated have a new heart and a new spirit created in them through the power of Christ's death and resurrection. Here it is. They are also further sanctified, really and personally, it says, really and personally, through the same power by his word and spirit dwelling in them, the dominion of the whole body of sin is destroyed, and the various evil desires that arise from it are moved more and more weakened and eventually put to death. At the same time, those called and regenerated are more and more enlivened and strengthened. You're strengthened in all saving graces. Notice it's not in your strength, in the grace, so that they practice true holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Don't be deceived. There's a generation, generations of people are deceived thinking they're going to claim Christ, live in holy lives, and somehow see the Lord. Some would push back on that. they say, well, that's works. You're saved by your work. No, 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 no. No. I'm so troubled by the generations of people who will say, well, I profess the Lord, but I live like hell for the rest of my life. And I, I, I fear for their souls. I do. And I think the word of God tells us. Why would Paul pray for this? Now, one of the supportive scriptures that, he, that is cited in the Baptist Confession is, guess what? Ephesians 3, 16 through 19. They knew what this meant. If we're not strengthened by God through the resurrection power of Christ or through the presence and indwelling by the Holy Spirit, what hope do you have to live holy? Or practice any kind of holiness. How could sanctification take place? There's a desire in the Christian life to strive to live in a manner worthy of our calling. Charles is going to work with me on a message next week in Ephesians chapter 4. We shift into a new section of the book. There's two divisions, 1 through 3 and 4 through 6. And this is the practical living out next week. 
There's no hope in living this out without a prayer like this, without the indwelling presence of the Spirit giving us power from on high. Paul prays that you are strengthened. They are strengthened with power from the Holy Spirit. And it leads us to live, to live out this sanctification. You might wonder what it looks like. Well, here's that Romans 12, 1 and 2 thing, okay? In the book of Romans, we have all the theology in, chapter, in chapters 1 through 11. 1 through 11. And then 12 comes, this is how you're to live it out, okay? comes a little further. Now listen to these verses. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present, there's your presentation, your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, hagios, and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Now, this is a passive verb structure to this word, be transformed. It's one word, be transformed. Metamorphose. We would say metamorphosis, all right? But metamorphose means that God is transforming the mind. What was verse 1? Present yourselves. What was chapters 1 through 11? God said it. They believed it. And now they're presenting themselves to God. This is... The sanctification, the three stages of holiness working out in the text itself. We see this pattern over and over again. God said it. They believed it. And now they're presenting themselves daily to God. And as a result, just like Moses, who came down off the mountain different, we're changed, conformed, and being conformed to the image of Christ. That's what's happening. So here's your application too. Present yourselves daily to the Lord so that you would be strengthened. This prayer of Paul's, Paul's sanctifying prayer. Pray this or something like it. God, I surrender my strength in me this day. In Article 2 of the Sanctification Chapter 13 in the 1689, it says, The sanctification extends through the whole person, though it is never completed in this life. Some corruption remains in every part. That's sobering, isn't it? It's true, though, isn't it? Don't you ever wonder about people who have this sort of false religious thing where they want to present to you that they never sin? I've actually had people tell me they, they don't have sin, but the Scripture says otherwise. From this arises a continual and irreconcilable war with the desires of the flesh against the Spirit and the Spirit against the flesh. Now, we know about this war of the flesh against the Spirit from our teaching in Galatians chapter 5 last year. Remember that? walk in the spirit to abate the things of the flesh and then we talk about fruits of the spirit and all of this you see to be sanctified is an ongoing lifelong interaction with god when you're in christ to be sanctified does not mean to be without sin it doesn't it means in our sin we go to god and god is changing us god i failed god i need you that's what we do only Christ was without sin. And God is fully aware of our condition of flesh. As Christians, he's aware of it. He's dealing with it. And through these three stages of holiness. This leads us to Article 3 of the 1689. In this war, the remaining corruption may greatly prevail for a time. Anybody ever feel like the corruption's prevailing a little bit for a time? You ever have that? That absolute epic failure? you like, I hope that didn't get videoed. You know, that kind of thing, or recorded in some way. Bad news. Yet through the continual supply of strength from the sanctifying spirit of Christ, the regenerate part overcomes. So the saints grow in grace. Well, they don't grow in their own power. They grow in grace. The unmerited favor of God perfecting holiness in the fear of God. They pursue a heavenly life in gospel obedience to all the commands of Christ as head and king has given them in his word. You see what the writers of the 1689 have done. They just plainly stated this is Christian living. This is what it means to be a, a Christian and to live out your faith. You're going to sin. You need God. You need the strength of God to live out this life. And God wants you to live a different life. The Christian who says, hey, listen, I'm going to keep on, hold on to all my things unrepentant and live the life I live maybe even worse and claim Jesus. They're just false converts. 
and, and, and I feel terrible about it all, but the messaging that we've given people is that somehow that they don't need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. They just want him to be saved. Save me. Let me hold on to my sin. Don't worry about being my Lord. You know, but the Lord wants to be your Lord and Savior. Happens. Never is the standard of perfection placed upon us in our own strength. That's never put on you. It's never put on the church in Ephesus. It's never put on us. But instead we look to the one who lived the perfect and sinless life in our place. And we look to his strength. That's why the writers cite Paul's prayer in Ephesians 3, 16 to 19. They saw this for what it was, a sanctifying prayer. So Paul prays that we're strengthened. Secondly, Paul prays this, that Christ would dwell in their hearts through faith. Our faith can rise and fall. It does. And thankfully, we serve a risen Savior who never wavers in his faith. An unwavering Savior who is our steady rock. Where we lack faith, Christ has always had perfect faith, right? For Jesus to dwell in your hearts is a life-changing reality. There's no such creature as a Christless Christian. If you have not Christ and profess Christ, you'll never have the peace, love, and joy and presence of Christ in this life or the next. Ephesians 2 verses 8 through 9, we taught this a few weeks ago, taught us that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Paul is praying here that you would have an abiding faith, an abiding faith of Christ dwelling, not simply the act of salvation. This is an abiding faith. Now we all can understand that there are times in our walk with Christ where we can feel, I don't feel like God is close to me. There's a great distance fixed between us. Something's wrong. But here, Paul is calling for us to pray, even in those moments of an abiding faith. I assure you, if there's a distance, you feel it. Humble yourselves in prayer. You'll be drawn to the presence of God so fast. Say this, you know, make your home in my heart, Lord, the dwelling presence of Christ. Now, the third petition of Paul in verse 17, you would be rooted and grounded in love. This is a very important thing to say. The verbs rooted and grounded are written in the passive mode. This means that we have Christ, but Christ's love is the thing that takes up the root in us. It's Christ that grounds us. It permeates every bit of us. Christ's love grounds us firmly to the ground, and it cannot be moved when we have Christ. It is not our strength. Nor is it our power that roots and ground us, not by our strength at all. It's an act actually of Christ in us. And Paul is praying for this. His power through God the Holy Spirit. And I think that's wonderful news that it's not up to us in our power to do that. That we're to submit to him. Present ourselves. And the roots just grow deeper and hold us tighter ever to Christ. I'm always put off by super knowledgeable Christians who lack the love of Christ. They're strange to me. They're not grounded or rooted in the love of Christ, but hey, you've met people like this. They can quote every schism that's ever existed in the history of the church, and they got countless notes in their Bibles, and, and, and they can quote this passage and that passage, but the love of Christ is missing. They have it. They have not the love of Christ. They use their knowledge to divide and divide and still further divide the body of Christ in June, Jude, half-brother of Jesus, said in verse 16, is just one chapter of these ones, that they are grumblers. Grumblers. Malcontents. They're never content. They can't have any peace. Grumblers, malcontents. And that they follow their own sinful desires. They're lawless. They grumble. They're malcontents. And they follow their own sinful desires. They're loudmouth boasters. Showing favoritism to gain advantage. What is this advantage? It could be simply they want to look better in the eyes of men and not think of the love of Christ in uniting his church. Paul taught about other divisions in 1 Corinthians 1, 11 through 13. He said, it's been reported to me by Chloe's people. Now let me tell you, if you run into Chloe's people, yeah, you better watch yourself. She'll report on you. <laughs> Chloe's people, that there's quarreling among you, brothers, what I mean is that each one of you says, I follow Paul or Apollos or I follow Kepa, Cephas, right? Or I follow Christ. And he says, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, we're, we're to be united in Christ. 
and we are to be rooted and grounded in his love we don't hold our own roots down by our strength even by how much we know and there are people who know a lot of stuff but without the love of Christ it's no good instead we are to believe what God has said believe it and we are to submit to him daily and each day the roots grow deeper and hold us ever tighter more firmly to the Lord okay here's your third application the back of your bully bully <laughs> I see comment there from Gloria I can't read it from here but hi Miss Gloria application three ask yourselves is my knowledge of God rooted and grounded in love that's a reflective just a check yourself is it rooted in love because if it's rooted in your own persona, if it's rooted in your own desire to look better, it's meaningless. It turns out that when we believe God, when we submit daily and we were rooted and grounded in love, that we're made able to do as verse 18 states, that we're able to then comprehend with all the saints. That's what Paul's praying for. So let's get all this right, strengthen them, Christ in your hearts, rooted and grounded in love, and that you would comprehend with all the saints. This is Paul's fourth petition. In other words, we gain understanding. The rooting and grounding leads us to this knowledge and wisdom of the Lord. It's no good to have knowledge and wisdom without first having the love of Christ. I know, I know people that really aren't that great with quoting the Bible. <laughs> but they love the Lord, and you know they do. And they love God's people. And that speaks volumes more than a know-it-all who doesn't have love in his heart. Or a her heart. <laughs> I'm not thinking of anybody. <laughs> I quoted this verse a few weeks ago about husbands loving their wives from Ephesians 5.26. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That he might, here's this word, hagiazo, that he might sanctify her. Ephesians 5.26. Having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. I was just realizing how much easier it is when we put these up on the screen. <laughs> you know, the, the, the passages just scroll up there, but that's not happening today. Sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word. What's this washing of water with the word? Well, it is the knowledge, this understanding and wisdom we gain as we're strengthened and given comprehension with the rest of the saints. Second Peter has a similar thing for us. Three, Second Peter 3, 17 and 18. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you're not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. You know that Jude reference earlier? Yeah, that's a lawless person. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So what is it that the believers come to comprehend with all the saints? Well, it turns out it's the enormity of of knowing the love of Christ. Height. It's breadth, it's depth, and it's width. It's beyond measure. And it is said to surpass that of even knowledge. I was going to go off into a whole Gnostic teaching and why the Gnostics sought knowing, but they did not seek loving God. And it was a great heresy, but that was a two-page segue. We just don't have time for that on Sunday, but... They sought knowledge, but not love, not obedience, loving God through their obedience. This is Paul's fifth petition, that to know the love of Christ surpasses even knowledge. This emphasis on the love of Christ surpassing knowledge is by no means discrediting knowledge. He's not saying don't know. We don't need to be ignorant. It instead brightly shows the supremacy of the love of Christ. And within that love construct, within the love of Christ, the faithful are to grow in their understanding of God. That's the right way to do it. If we just try to grow in our understanding but have not the love of Christ, it's a perversion of the faith. 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 3, Paul wrote about puffed up knowledge without love. He said it leads a man or woman to pride and thinking much of their own knowledge. He said now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. He said we all got that, right? But this knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. 
Love builds up. If anyone imagines he knows something, he does not know yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. We are to live in, friends, and have our entire being built up. I keep saying the word, be, it's being, not being, like a kidney bean. Being built up inside the love of Christ. Now I'm wanting chili. Okay. <laughs> if we are to gain any knowing, let it be under, under the umbrella of Christ's love. That's where we are to gain our knowing. Now let's look at Paul's final petition in verse 19. He began the verse by saying that they would have this love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. But he ends it saying that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now the verb for being filled, may, or the words you may be filled, is plerothete. Again, I won't put it on my screen today, and you don't have to memorize this. But this word plerothete um, contains one word in the Greek, but four words in the English. You may be filled, plerothete. But here's what I want you to notice about this word, plerothete. It's written in the subjunctive mode. It means this. It's not a promise that this is going to happen for you. Though it, it could, and it should. It should happen for all believers. But it's not a guaranteed promise like an indicative verb might be. A matter of fact. There's an element of doubt, in fact, written into it. Because it's structured this way that it will come to completion in your life. All right? And so let's, let's figure that out. Let's just say it this way. If you seek God's strength, like Paul is praying for here, if, if this is for you to be strengthened, that Christ would dwell in you, that you would gain understanding in the love of Christ, well, you'll, you'll find that God's going to fill you with his fullness. But if you're a lazy Christian, and there are lazy Christians, you probably won't be filled with the fullness of God. You'll just walk around lazy and ignorant. You might be saved. And that's fine. But you won't grow in your faith. If you won't read and study and obey God's words, you can be saved, but you won't grow until you drink in God's special revelation of himself given to us in the Bible. And we need to hear good sermons by faithful preachers. We don't need to hear always great sermons. There are plenty if you want to listen to them out there. Um, plenty of great pastors. I listen to sermons every day. But we should be as the Bereans were. Students searching the scriptures for our answers. Now many Christians today are going to remain spiritual infants. They instead prefer to rely not on God's word. But their own wit. Their own sense of like philosophies and their own deep thinking and it's okay to have wits and deep thinking but we need to as christians depend upon what god said so that we can believe it in our minds and present ourselves to god outside of that we will not be living in this sanctified thing we'll be living on our own they do not read or study god's word so they know not the lord fully again i'm not claiming they aren't saved they might not be but i'm not saying anyone is Instead, they remain spiritual children. This can happen for years or decades. Some people will spend their whole lives living this way rather than stepping and being faithful in the kingdom of God. Here's your fourth application. Are you a student of God's word? Another question. Are you faithful in prayer? Or are you that lazy Christian? And... That's just something for us to think about. Nobody knows your study habits. Nobody knows your personal prayer life. Not saying that just so you go, man, I didn't do this one thing Paul asked me to do. It makes me a lazy Christian. No. You know the patterns in your own life. And if that's you, or if you're watching online and that's you, and you're a lazy Christian, well, let's start praying for you. God, strengthen me and might intervene. Put this in me, the thing I don't really have. Not bad, right? So here's the thing. You think if Paul prayed these six things and then we prayed these six things, that it wouldn't have an effect on us? That if we started not only praying it, that God said it in his word and that we believed it in our minds and we started living it out. I said minds, I touched my mouth. It's kidney beans again. It, in our minds, and then we started living it out, that somehow we wouldn't grow in our faith? No, God is conforming you to the image of Christ. 
He prayed these six things that you would be strengthened in your inner man through the power of the Holy Spirit, that Christ would dwell in your hearts, rooted and grounded in love, and that you would comprehend and understand spiritual truths, knowing the love of Christ surpasses even that of knowledge and to be filled with all the fullness of God. That would change us if we believed what God said and we lived it out. And I hope you're challenged by this, no matter how short you've been a Christian, or maybe you've been walking for decades with the Lord. Let it challenge us. It challenges me as a pastor. Can you see why Paul then closes the last two verses? We'll get through this real quick. Verses 20 and 21 of chapter 3. Here's how he closes this whole section of chapters 1, 2, and 3. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever amen paul didn't just pray for that generation he prayed for you and for me this generation and the generations of believers to come paul is saying here that god is not only going to give us the things he's asked but much more and why why would god give us more than we've asked because god is able and he gives to his family in abundance he gives us more than we even know to ask for Things we couldn't even imagine to ask for, he gives us. Can you imagine conceiving of grace and being able to give it like God gives? He gives us more than, he gives us the love of Christ to grow in. This is one reason he's God. And from what I read, he's, he's a really good God. <laughs> he's a really good God to us. So we should join Paul in his praise. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let me close with this statement. God has declared you in Christ to be holy. In his mind, he said it. You're the saints, the set-apart ones in Christ. Do you believe it in your mind? <laughs> I do. If so, start to pray that God would do all of this and more in your life as he continues to sanctify you.